It's hard to believe that for over a hundred years, enjoying the full London Savile Row bespoke tailoring experience required one to travel repeatedly to London. This has all changed now. For the first time in tailoring history, a Savile Row based bespoke tailoring house has opened a full time permanent location here in New York for the exclusive purpose of servicing their American clientele. No longer is one required to travel repeatedly to London to commission a bespoke suit. I'm Kirby Allison, and I love helping the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Join me as we explore the world of quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. Just a few steps down from Carnegie Hall at 130 West 57th Street, Huntsman, New York has established its New York home. In an old building built a hundred years ago as an artist cooperative, this couldn't be a more fitting place for Huntsman to service its American clientele. Let's go inside and meet the team. Ed, <laughs> nice Perfect. to see you again. Good morning. Welcome yeah, back to you. Huntsman, New yeah, York. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we just, uh, you know, we just got back from London, and it's so nice to have been able to see, you know, the London workshop of Huntsman, but then so soon after come here and see you here in New York. Yeah, I understand it was a wonderful experience, and uh, it's very exciting to have you here today because New York is really just the extension of London. So I like to think of it as Charles Dickens. A tale of two cities but instead of London and Paris it's London and New York. This room right here, our foyer, is, represents our incredible archive and it speaks not only to the nearly 175 year history of Huntsman but also this incredible relationship, long-standing relationship now going on three centuries of American clients and Savile Row. And here we have depicted various garments, patterns, mm -hmm. measurement forms for some of our notable American clients. Everyone, of course, knows our long-standing relationship with Gregory Peck. And the movie star. To Ralph Lauren. Of course. Uh, Mark Jacobs, Nicole Kidman. On the walls, you'll see patterns of clients from Steve Miller to Dr. Henry Kissinger. Uh, measurement sheets on this wall, and let's not forget, it's not just about Huntsmen, it's about Hunts women as well. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Hepburn, who was a long-standing client next to Bill Blass's measurements. Mm -hmm. Lauren Hutton's pattern is on the wall there, so that goes on and on. It is an incredible collaboration that not only represents the bespoke needs of men, but also women in yeah. this marketplace. Well, it's incredible. I mean, with 175 years, you know, one of the things that I'm just constantly in awe and struck by, especially with these heritage Savile Row tailoring houses, you know, isn't just the history of the British aristocracy and, you know, the businessmen of London, but, you know, the movie stars and everyone else at a bespoke tailoring house like Huntsman serves. One of the things that's really exciting to see the cutting room open here in New York is uh, formalizing just the relationship that this tailoring house has had with America. Because for as long as the Savile Row tailoring houses have existed, America has always been an important part of the clientele, right? Absolutely. Uh, and a very important part, and in some cases a dominant part. Huntsman has a singular advantage where we've got an in situ, 24-7 cutting theater manned by a London-born Huntsman trained cutter. So it represents an incredible differentiation point in the marketplace to anyone else. Yeah. And we're very proud of being able to bring that to our clients. Yeah. I mean, really, it's quite groundbreaking for Huntsman to have a, you know, really an extension of the London experience here in New York. But before that, you know, American clients, you know, in order to get the full London bespoke experience, had to travel to London, you know, to experience that. Uh, and to meet with their tailors, or they were left, you know, coordinating with their traveling tailor schedules, you know, to meet in hotel rooms, you know, once or twice or maybe three times a year. Absolutely, and if London was not a convenience, the inconvenience of trying to book appointments in San Francisco or Beverly Hills, where the cutter may be coming through for one day or a day and a half, you can't be assured that a client's going to be available on the day that you're there. So often those appointments are truncated to three months or four months or six months hence. 
and it, the process of having a suit made and delivered could take many, many months, if not several years. Yeah. What we do here actually represents a true paradigm shift. So we can not only represent huntsmen in America, but we provide an ongoing, continual, no, no break supplied level of service and availability to American clients. So not only uh, were we able to take care of people from our history, like Gregory Peck, that coat having been made for him by the famous Colin Hammock on May 30th, 1960. Wow. But today's clients in the 21st century have access to us at all times. Uh, further reference to our history is this incredible map that indicates where all the fox hunts took place in the United States and every one of those buttons represents a town or a city or a village where those fox hunts took place and many of those garments were produced by huntsmen. And part of the heritage of that coat, of course, is the hunting coats. Yes. I mean, the one-button stance, the slightly flared, flared skirt. And further to that, as, as all Savile Row tailors have a history, mm -hmm. and some, some histories are from the naval history, some from the army, uh, some from other points of reference, mm -hmm. uh, huntsmen's heritage is based on the equestrian heritage. So our quintessential cut with the close fitting shoulder, the high armhole, the nip waist, and the slightly flared skirt, one button with the pockets referencing that are really right out of the 19th century beginnings of, of H. Huntsman and Sons. Yeah, and we see this in the piece right here, you know, that is the fox hunting. Absolutely, and there of course is a picture of Colin Hammock actually fitting that garment in London on one of these pieces uh, probably 50 years ago. So this room, Ed, I mean, it really is that link between London and New York, your provenance and history. I mean, this in some ways is kind of an archival room. You have these pieces that you've done, you know, throughout history for some of your famous clients. Uh, but one of the things that immediately sticks out to me is it's not just your clients, but it's your American clients. Absolutely. And we're trying to really focus on that so that clients understand that this relationship between Savile Row and America, in particular Huntsman, goes back almost to the beginning when we started in 1849, when Henry Huntsman bought a breeches maker and founded the, the new company. Mm -hmm. uh, this building that we're in today, which is ironically a historic building, was built in 1907 as an artist commune. Uh, it's older in terms of its existence than our time on Savile Row. We're just celebrating our 100th year at 11 Savile Row. Mm -hmm. So we have the bones here that give us the same credibility as we have in, in London. And I think American clients are coming to appreciate this singular bespoke experience yeah. that they can enjoy at Huntsman. Well, yeah. one of the biggest challenges for an American who wanted a proper British bespoke suit has always been connecting with his tailor, either requiring that they travel to London or meet with them, you know, the three or four times that they travel to America. So one of the things that's incredible here is not only, you know, do you have a permanent cutter, you know, that's based here in New York, but you're able to do it here. And whenever I walk in this room, I really can't help but feel like I'm in London. Well, we've not only replicated that experience here in New York, but as we all know, the most important part of any bespoke tailoring house and its heart and soul is its cutting room. Kirby, I'd like to welcome you to Huntsman, New York. Ralph. Kirby. Hey, great to see you again. And you, have you been? Yeah, uh, great, great. Thanks for having us. It's so great to be here in New York. And of course, here we are in your cutting room. The unique experience of Huntsman is defined by Ralph in, in this room. It's the reason why someone comes here. Uh, every time we see a new client, we engage that client. After we have our initial conversation or consultation, the first thing we do is to introduce him or her to the cutting room and, and to Ralph. The bespoke cutter is the foundation of that bespoke experience. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that's just so incredible about having you here in New York Again, it's not just the full London experience of what it feels like, but really more importantly, you know, that full bespoke experience of having easy access to you and you being here every day. And Ralph, of course, represents the new generation of Savile Row Cutter. London born, Huntsman trained. Uh, he's, a, he's a very young man and clients can have an entire lifetime of Huntsman experience with him, which is a very exciting prospect for most clients who are 
used to seeing tailors in the United States who are on the, the, the last end of, of their journey, not at the beginning of their journey. Yeah, so we've cut the average down at least by half of the average age of a bespoke tailor here in New York. So, uh, you know, Ralph, I mean, you are part of this new generation of incredibly talented bespoke cutters that's really exciting to see, you know, kind of coming into their own. But talk to us a little bit about your background because, you know, you're young, but you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, I started when I was 16. Uh, I started on Mount Street in London with Campbell Carey, who's the head cutter of Huntsman and creative director. Um, so I've been working with him for eight years. Wow. Um, Actually, we met on Valentine's Day eight years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's worked out really well um, opening this, this front for Huntsman here um, because we have great synergy in the work that we create. So the garments that we make here are, are pretty much the same or very small nuances with the products that Campbell would cut and Dario would cut in, in London. Yeah, I mean, it's really the exact same thing is what you would be doing in London. I mean, you know, you're meeting with the clients here, you're drawing the pattern, striking the fabric, cutting. I mean, the only difference is that instead of walking it downstairs like you would in London, you just put it in a box and ship it over there yeah. because all the sewing is still done in London. I mean, it's still a proper British made garment. It's exactly the same process, but you're completely right. It's sent overnight rather than walking down a flight of stairs. And also, you know, I'm not losing any communication with coat makers and trouser makers. I've known these coat makers and trouser makers since I was 16, so yeah. we stood on the phone every day and if there's a, something that they've picked up, that, um, an issue or a suggestion, I'm on the phone with them. Yeah, and again, I always go back to you know, the, the bespoke experience and I think what creates so much richness is having that personal relationship with your cutter. It's really you know, one of the sacred relationships I feel like a well-dressed man has, you know, his shoemaker, his shirt maker, his, his tailor, his barber. And so, you know, having you here local just allows an, a degree of access that previously was unattainable for Americans for the most part. Yes, very much so. I mean, from the clients that we've taken since we've opened um, on 57th Street, you know, there's a really comfortable environment to be in. Clients of ours will come in just for a, a chat, for a coffee, mm -hmm. you know, during the process of their orders. And they can actually watch me uh, mark up the the cloth and chop it out in front of them. It's something it's I don't think New Yorkers have had the opportunity to really see, um, not in recent years anyway. Yeah. Um, and are they getting the garments faster too? I mean, because again, part of the challenge for an American was connecting with their cutter right. or their tailor. It's the same lead time. I mean, as we just mentioned, it's sent in a box overnight. You're not, we're not losing any time. But it's the same lead time for the gentleman that lived in London. Yeah. You know, for the American otherwise, I mean, it, it probably has cut it down to six months for... Very much so. We're seeing, uh, we're going to destinations qu quarterly, sometimes more than that. Beforehand, it would take clients a couple of years sometimes here. I think maybe in the past, meeting a cutter in a hotel room and walking out, you have nothing really to show for it. Yeah. Now you can actually see the whole process mm -hmm. and it's... It's a great thing, and you can see that the clients are excited about it. Yeah, and I think savor it more. Yes. Because in a hotel room, you're booked all day. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have, what, 30, 45 minutes with the client? Definitely, and you're looking through uh, bunches, travel bunches, that aren't particularly inspiring. Here, we have the whole set of bunches and bolts of cloth, just like in London. It's yeah. a real home from home. Yeah. You know, so you studied with Campbell, you know, for eight years, but, I mean, it was a proper apprenticeship, wasn't it? Definitely. I, I don't think it's anything you can learn in school. Not as yet, anyway. Um, but even I'm, I'm learning off of people that passed away, to be quite honest. Old patterns of cutters from the 60s and 70s that we have hanging up on our walls here. It's, it's incredible. That's what I take a lot of inspiration from. Old hammock patterns, old um, even Terry Haste and many other cutters. That's what I get my inspiration from, is patterns that I see, and I learn a lot from the makers as well. Coat makers, trouser makers, because we have the best team yeah. on Savile Row, and I get, I get first-hand contact with them. So you're actually pulling some of those patterns down and kind of reverse engineering their cuts? Yeah, their cuts, their lapel shapers. I'm always working on different lapel shapers things that I've seen come in the door. It's just utterly fascinating. That's what I get a kick out of. In some ways, it's, a, it's an oral 
tradition. I mean, you were taught by someone how to do this. You didn't necessarily read it in the book. I mean, how do you carry that forward as now, you know, the cutter here, you know, bring this tradition to New York? That is actually one of my main objectives here. I want to teach young Americans the way I was taught and get this a bit of a revival in New York tailoring because sadly and unfortunately some of the greats have, haven't passed on their, their knowledge or experience here in New York so there's a massive lack for true bespoke. Lots of made to measure which is great to see even in this building. There's lots of made to measure but not enough true bespoke and there's nothing I don't think you can be taught in colleges as yet which are completely appropriate to huntsman cutting or making. Um, so that is my main objective to teach young Americans and that's something we're going to be trying to push for definitely and get New York and 57th Street up to the same level as Savile Row yep. at some point. So coming in, you know, seeing the foyer, seeing all the bolts of fabric, you know, walking into this cutting room, seeing you striking, you know, working on your boards. I mean, this is the reason that the British, you know, London Savile Row bespoke experience is so renowned around the world. Yeah, a true representation of Savile Row. And this is exactly what American clients have come to us for. So they can share that same experience that it once took them a 3,000 mile journey to enjoy. Yeah. It's available to them here in Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. And so where does the bespoke experience start? I mean, we come in, we've seen, you know, the you know, Huntsman has this incredible history and provenance. It's the, the pinnacle of the craft. But for a new client that comes in, where does it begin? Well, they all want to start with the measurements because they want to get into the fitting room. They want to see how Ralph uses the tape to take their measures and to understand how their garment is going to be made. So I think without further ado, we yeah. should take your measures. Yeah, let's go do that. So here we are, now we're in the fitting room. Yes, so this is all part of the vertical experience. I take all my clients' measures, and I find it important for drafting the pattern. Different cutters take measures slightly differently to others. I like being in control of the whole process. So I like to begin with taking, if the client's got a jacket on, take his uh, balance measure. Um, I don't take any measures to replicate the jacket they're wearing. It's got nothing to do with that. It's to determine um, the client's stance. Um, and that's all I need for the jacket. If I take some measures with the jacket off now. I use this measure to pretty much establish the length of the coat I'm going to cut you. Um, so I take that ground measure and I half it, and more common than not now, I take half an inch off of that measure. Okay. So I think and that's the length of the jacket that you know, traditionally should completely cover the seat. Yeah. And then Huntsman is, is normally slightly longer than... Slightly longer, but again, nowadays I do take off that half an inch. Also I do ask the client what kind of length for their lung. Um, more often than not, they want something slightly shorter nowadays. Then from there, I take this measurement. So if I just get you to move your arms slightly, and I run that tape across your back there. And this, it looks bizarre, but it is actually to establish your depth of sight. So I'm using this to calibrate the height of your armhole that I'm going to cut. I want it to be high up visually and for comfort, but not so much that it's uncomfortable. From the nape to where the tape intersects here, that will give me a rough guide of how high to cut that armhole for you. 
And that's another element of a, a properly cut bespoke suit is, you know, it fits tight, not tight, but it, it fits snug on the shoulders. Yes. And that, you know, you've got a, a high arm size for freedom of movement. And so that whenever you're moving, the entire jacket's not contorting with you. If the armhole's cut too low, every time you move, you're going to drag half the jacket with you. It's going to feel very uncomfortable. Okay. But at the same time, you don't want it too high up and it's pinching you. Yeah. Um, it's about finding that perfect sweet spot, pretty much. Uh, then, from there, I take your chest, your waist, your trouser waist, and you'll see. Now that we've taken your measurements, I want to actually take you through some garments. All right. Well, Kirby, why don't you have a seat here at the desk, and we'll, we'll chat about fabric and I don't think I've ever seen model. so many books of fabric in one place. So when we were talking, you were thinking about a double-breasted suit, but I could tell that you were quite taken by some of our proprietary tweeds. So mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that we do a tweed ensemble okay. for your first outfit. Uh, Not a bad place to start. It's a good place to start, and you'll have a you know really a, a quintessential huntsman garment. So thinking about what we looked at inside, let me just show you this jacket again. So this one is the tweed that we made for the family in the Midwest, and it was designed by Campbell uh, as part of their brief, mm -hmm. and it was done with an understanding that they wanted to to include the colors of some of the limestone rock that comes from one of their quarries. And I think we actually did, and this was actually done in, in concert with Johnson's of Elgin, did a fantastic job of creating that, and they were absolutely thrilled. Actually to the point where they not only want to have garments where we've made jackets, waistcoats, dresses, skirts, caps. One of the brothers now wants to cover all of the slipper chairs in his house in Michigan, and they want to have <laughs> fabric available for the next two generations of the family. Oh, wow. So if you think about the, the history of Huntsman and you think about the pillars, mm -hmm. this really speaks to that because in, in a generation when you and I won't be in the business any longer, one of the grandchildren will walk into Savile Row, probably 11 Savile Row, and say, I'd like to get a garment made in my family's tweed. And someone will look at them and say, what is your name? <laughs> and when they tell them who it is, someone will realize that in the vault, is the fabric that belongs to this family. That's so been a, sitting there for yep. you know, decades and by it's, that And it's, it's a wonderful story. Yeah. So I think you should be the proud owner of a PEC 62. Wow. And with that, I might suggest you do something a little bit more interesting. You could make the outfit your own, uh, both with the trousers selection and with, and with the lining. So and this is something you could even do, you know, two different pairs of odd trousers. Absolutely. And almost rotate it with absolutely. anything. Absolutely. So one of the great fabrics would be, you know, again, we'll look at color, but to go into the archive for Holland and Sherry, the Dakota range has got, you know, some of the classic uh, cavalry twills mm -hmm. and whipcords that really harken back to the heritage of cloth making in the United Kingdom and actually speaks about our equestrian heritage as well. And then we could pair that alternatively with a lovely pair of flannels and it doesn't have to be your father's gray flannel. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, uh, if you ask it's me if there flannel. was a color of flannel, this is a, about 11, 12 ounces. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a worsted finish. Mm -hmm. So it has all of the depth, but it's not gonna feel as, as heavy yeah. to wear. Uh, so kind you know, of a, quite a Texas winter flannel. Absolutely. <laughs> so yes, you can wear this in Texas for sure. So I think that's one of the incredible things about a tailoring house such as Huntsman is, you know, working with you and working with Ralph, the incredible knowledge that you guys have about the fabrics, you know, that really takes something that for a client is overwhelming. I mean, you guys literally have over 10,000 choices, but to have someone that, you know, has a, a, enough depth to the relationship with their client 
and understands you know, who they are, how they wear their clothing, you know, what they're interested in, that they can take that and make these incredibly personalized recommendations that at the end of the day are producing one-of-a-kind unique pieces you know, for your clients. Well, that's certainly our objective and when we achieve that, um, we've achieved some degree of success. I mean, even the most important clients and the most long-standing clients, and Gregory Peck's a good example, there's a man who had 150 garments. Mm -hmm. So if you think of those 150 garments compared to the number of options here, he only touched the surface of that. So for me to pretend that I could let you sit here and look through all of these fabrics and come up with a clear and concise choice, you know, we're looking at opposite ends of the hourglass, mm -hmm. and that little piece that's in the middle, that's yeah. where we have to meet where I put up enough things on the table that ab absolutely resonate with you and, and serve your purpose, <clears throat> and you have been satisfied with, the, with those uh, selections and those recommendations. Yeah, and it's the expertise, again, you know, of the people you know, that work here. I mean, you, Ralph, I just in the same way that it's the expertise of Campbell and Dario and the team in London you know, that allow for this level of service that you just don't get outside of a proper London bespoke tailoring house. It's, it's, it's um, I think, the height of what happens on Savile Row, and given the complexity and the complexion of Huntsman, it's actually a unique situation because we all have a, a special set of skills that we bring to the table. Uh, and this is, you know, to segue back to what we talked about initially, this is a very good example. This is the original cloth that was copied, that was produced mm -hmm. by Johnston's for Huntsman mm -hmm. on the Peck Cashmere. And because they've got such a big investment in all of our tweed business, we decided, Campbell, to take the cashmere production and move that to Joshua Ellis. So we went from a mill that's founded in 1797 to one that's 50 years older. So they are the, yeah. they're the century, battleship, yeah. 252 years running of okay. making cashmere. I think uh, ultimately men don't enjoy shopping. No. We don't like you know, being presented with a million options and then having to choose. I mean, uh, and the ultimate pursuit is really the simplification of our lives. And I think in so many ways a bespoke tailor uh, is such an important part of that pursuit because, again, you know, you're able to develop these really you know, long-standing relationships with your clients so that a client comes in and they really don't have to make decisions. You know, they have a drink, you know, walk around, catch up. And it's just through this conversation that you're pulling things out, and next thing you know, you have an incredibly unique and really perfectly suitable. Totally agree. And, no and, pun intended. And men tend suggestion. to be can be very sentimental about the things that are their things. You yeah. know, they don't. You know, they they're very protective of those things. So, when you start to establish a relationship with a client that kind of goes beyond the four walls of mm -hmm. we just make your suits. Yeah. We don't just make your suits. We're part of your life. We're part of your lifestyle. You know, once you enter the world of bespoke, it's so much more than the product. I mean, the product is important and it's exceptional and it's at the highest level. But just the story of how these pieces come about is really what gives meaning to a garment so that whenever you're wearing it, you know, I think back and reflect on this conversation that I had with you and the time that, you know, you were able to pull these pieces out and we were able to talk through it and this kind of spontaneously came together or, you know, the fact that, you know, we had dinner last night and, you know, the conversation we had then, you know, those memories, you know, ultimately go into a garment like this and then you know who made it and the fact that they knew that they were making it for you, again, I think just creates something that is hard to really kind of put your ha hand on that really makes a garment, a bespoke garment, so much more special than the garment itself. Thank you very much. We, we certainly agree with that, and that's how we try to run our business and run our lives every day. Yeah. Because the, the experience should not just be special, it should be exceptional in every way. A client can go and have a suit made or a jacket made anywhere. And sometimes we have tunnel vision and we think that whatever we do, no one else can do. Well, a lot of people can do what we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to kind of redouble our efforts every day to make sure that what we do, we look at, you know, with, at a distance yeah. and with circumspection to make sure that what we're doing is absolutely special. Yeah, and that's what makes Huntsman Huntsman in so many ways. So we've, we've got this, you know, we've got an idea of kind of what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So what's next? I mean, we've taken my measurements, you know, we've made some selections in terms of cloth and style. So where does it go from here? 
Well, one of the things that we can look at would be how you would like to do the additional trimming. And, you know, we can do the skull and crossbones, we can do anything that you want, and we also have the ability to make a proprietary lining. We have a client in Pittsburgh who has reproduced uh, under license Salvador Dali's. Oh, really? For the inside of his jackets and the linings cost him more than the coats. Oh, wow. I think one of the things with a, with a tweed, where you've got you know, a lot going on in the story of the actual yarn, is to pick out uh, a lining, possibly something in a shot lining, which, which, which has got two, two colors in it, so the colors kind of bleed through, and pick out something in a color story that makes sense for you, and possibly like to pick out you know, like the overcheck or the window pane in a blue. Mm -hmm. When we look at the, the design of the garment, uh, I showed you the classic Huntsman silhouette, mm -hmm. because if we do a jacket, that's probably very important. Yeah. to do uh, one button, mm -hmm. slanted pocket. Mm -hmm. Now doing the cash pocket, that's a personal decision. It will look good and actually will show off the handiwork of the coat maker and the cutter because the matching of the plaids mm -hmm. is part of the magic of making a beautiful garment. So the more pockets you have, the more we can sh showcase that. So what's the next step? I and mean, we've taken my measurements, we've come here, we've spoken. Uh, about you know generally what we're going to do the PEC 62, the you know the uh, doe skin uh, waistcoat, you know two pairs of odd trousers. So now we're going to talk about modeling, linings, and buttons. And I think I'll ask Ralph to step in because yeah. since we make a lot of these garments, I can go through what I envision these items should look like, and he can get some give some input, and we can see what which is best for you. Okay. So I will ask Ralph to step in. Ralph, would you be kind enough to step in, please? <laughs> so for Kirby, we're looking at doing a PEC 62. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do it with an odd vest, so the, the Hainsworth doe skin, which would be fantastic. And we need to talk about line back or solid back and buttons with that, so I want to have your input. I thought what would, would be nice, because of the color combinations here, to do one of the shot linings where you have the blue but the green runs through it, so, so you're going to get the shape. reference of yeah. all the colors that are in here. Lovely. And perhaps we do uh, you know, a lighter color contrasting piping and jets inside the jacket. Two wad trousers, so both from uh, Holland and Sherry, one a little bit dressier in a charcoal brown flannel and in a 13, 14 ounce covert, which would be nice. I think maybe for at least this, if not both, we should do the lap seam on the trousers because doing the swell dutch on the jacket would be, would be nice. What else are we leaving out? Buttons? Do we do, you know, for cuffs, do you think we should do turn up cuffs on the, uh, the jacket or? I think there's enough going on with the cloth. I think it really sings for itself. Maybe one thing we can do, as they're all separates, maybe do a, a nice collar, a lapel on the, on the vest with okay. also a swelled edge as well. Mm -hmm. That'd be really nice, 3 8 swelled edge. Um, and that'll show up nicely against the solid yeah. doe skin as well. Definitely, lovely choice. And what do you think about a seven and a half button to bring out the, the richness of the, the horn? And also that's one of our signature two hole buttons. I think that would. What about buttons on the cuff? For jackets, as it's a separate, um, I'd suggest four, or you could be a bit more creative and maybe have, so on mine here, I've got three. But okay. make sure if you do three, have them spaced accordingly. And you'll notice that on Ralph's jacket, those are done that way. And what's, what's the history with the three buttons? It's not something I see ever. Um, it, well, it just leaves you with the option of wearing it as a separate, and it doesn't look so much as a suit jacket. Really? Okay. It gives you that option. It's something I've always liked. It's just yeah. a bit of personality to okay. it, really. But you know, what other kind of details we could work in this, you know, to really make it. Well, we talked mine. about doing the, the Dax closure, so mm -hmm. you'll have the, the tab is sewn in to the waistband. It's elasticized, and mm -hmm. then you have buttons. I think Ralph actually has the Dax closure on, okay. on these trousers. So it's it's very classic, and it's named after the Dax trousers. So it's something that you know. James Bond popularized mm -hmm. it in his own wardrobe that was done by Anthony Sinclair. Okay. So even though it's got historic relevance, it's still pretty modern because it goes back to the, to the 60s. 
uh, but our clients like it because it's a little bit sleeker. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the extra appendage of the piece of cloth as you're yeah. tightening up the tabs and you've got a little squirrel. Yeah. And also that will work nicely with your pleated trousers. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a very, yeah. very and elegant And turn-ups, of course. Turn what do you think, an inch and three quarters or two? Um, maybe on these two, slightly larger. Yeah. Especially if we do the lap seams, make yeah. it a little bit more pronounced. Okay. And then what about the back of the jacket? I saw you had one of the... Uh, you know, was it the pec uh, cashmere that it was a single piece back or it what was, was it? It was a worsted camel hair that okay. was done uh, for that client, a special request. So, you know, being that it's bespoke. Okay. And one of the other things we should uh, talk about is if you think you might want to wear the waistcoat separately, mm -hmm. we can do it with a cloth back. We okay. can line it with the lining on the inside so that it's smoother to get on. We can make it one continuous piece. There'll be side seams, of course, but yeah. it'll be lined in the cloth And the back. reason you would do lining versus cloth back is it would create a cooler waistcoat. Yeah, but the, cloth back gives you more versatility in being able to wear it without the jacket. And you're buying an, an, you know, an autumn outfit here, so yeah. we're, not, we're not trying to achieve yeah. uh, you know, air conditioning. Air conditioning. It, this, is, this is about something which is very authentic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it would look fantastic. Yeah. No, let's do that. So, Kirby, do you want to come see yeah. the pattern being drawn? Yeah, that would be great. Please, after great. you, come on through. Yeah, thank you. So here we are. This is, this is your room. This is mine. So these are your boards, right? So this is where you do yeah. all the magic. Pretty much. Uh, these boards are exact replicas of the ones that we have in the London. It was a nightmare getting them up, but I'm so <laughs> pleased that I've got them. Um, so they, I mean, they have to be familiar to you because I mean, you trained, you know, of course, with with Campbell in London. So I mean, whenever you're here, do you do you feel like you're in New York? Uh, yeah, but these ones, don't tell anyone, a bit shorter because I'm slightly shorter than Campbell. <laughs> Um, so that's that, but this is where I spend most of my day. So we've taken the measurements and then what, I mean, you're going to start working on the pattern. Yeah. And so this is, I guess this paper is where it's done. Yeah, actually I'm very lucky. Uh, we used to use, I always grew up using a, a much uh, lighter paper, but I really like this and I have this specifically made for us in Philadelphia. And it's the perfect weight. I can fold it into my pattern bags perfectly. And I feel that after time, they don't lose their shape. They don't wear. I can get a real clean, clean shapes for armholes and curves and such. And they don't blunt or crimple yeah. like other paper. Every time uh, I see you uh, with a garment or a fitting, uh, the paper pattern that I'm going to draft is going to be updated accordingly. Um, so it's constantly changing you know I've had a client that's followed me since I've started or since I became a cutter and it's gone in and out in and out armholes change shape so what tools do you have to do this uh, paper shears which I've had for eight years but these are probably a hundred years old Wow um, I'm quite obsessed with old tools mm -hmm. um, they don't make them quite the same quite frankly especially with shears and scissors, just, uh, yeah. you don't get the same quali uh, quality of hard metal and soft metal. They're, mm -hmm. they're differently made, or maybe it's just me being Well, every tailor nostalgic. is very particular about his shears. Yeah, uh, people get into arguments when people pin so someone else's. moving them around. Yeah, moving them around, or you see someone cutting up a piece of paper with your, with your shears. Um, it's important to take great care in your tools. I've very rarely get new ones and these tools that I've had have lasted my whole career and my whole apprenticeship and my shears I've never sharpened once and I try to keep it in, in great condition as possible because with your <coughs> cutting shears it consists of two kinds of metal you've got your hard metal at the front which actually cuts the fabric mm -hmm. and you've got the soft metal attached to it you can actually see a thin line so the more you sharpen them the less hard metal you're going to get. Um, and when that goes down really thin, it's not going to be the same result. It's not going to be as sharp, it's not going to be as precise. Um, and so something like this you would never use to cut paper? Definitely only not. Only oh cloth. God, no. No, no, no. Um, I take great pride in my tools. And I mean, how formulaic is this versus how much of it is just rock of eye? I mean, just your intuition 
and you know, 12 years of experience? I think it's probably 50-50. Okay. I think, obviously, your chest, waist, seat, um, those measures, they don't lie. So I use those for, you know, using scale to work those out. But if someone's got an athletic chest and to work out what kind of dart you want to put in the chest um, to throw shape over it correctly, um, I think that's rock of iron. And working out how far down you want to throw that shape. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, um, the round of your back, I think that's by eye. I don't think there's a set in, uh, set in stone curve um, that's correct. Everyone is completely different. But I think the fundamentals of balance mm -hmm. and uh, getting your essential four uh, measurements correct, again, chest, coat waist, trouser waist, and seat, those, I go by my book. Okay. Um, I go by the draft that I've, I've been taught and I've adapted. Uh, but there's, I like to think there's 50-50 and it's, the pattern is also somewhat dictated by the cloth. So on a trouser pattern, for mm -hmm. instance, you'll have a trouser length for cottons okay. and a trouser length for your wool. Okay. Um, for shrinkage and also for the mm -hmm. amount of break that the client wants. Yeah. On a cotton pair of trousers, you probably want less break in the toe of your trouser. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all noted on these patterns. All that information it isn't just a set of numbers. You've got someone's almost story on it. Yeah. Where do you start? I mean, what is the first line you draw? on a jacket pattern? On a jacket pattern, so that I draft inwards like okay. this. Other cutters do it differently. Do a nice long straight line and then I establish the jacket length of the back. Drafted the pattern, you've cut yes. the pattern pieces out, but then how do you take this to the actual fabric before you cut it? Before I chop and strike anything out, I will lay out the cloth on a pressing unit to get out all the residual uh, shrinkage. Do you have something you can show us? I mean, I'd love to, I always love seeing the handwork of uh, an inside of a jacket. Yeah, here's one here. Here's a baste, and this is a uh, tweed that we did in collaboration with the rake. So you can see here all those lovely pad stitches. And this is the, I mean, I mean it's not even finished yet, right? Because no. what, there'd be even more pad stitching. And you're constructing the canvas by hand, am I correct? Yes. Because, I mean, some, you know, even high-end made to measure uses a prefabricated canvas. Yep. And that even the canvas is. No, all by hand. All these instructions you leave, you can actually see the techniques they use. That cut I was showing you earlier on for the mm -hmm. prominent chest, you can see that's been cut through here. And it's a double cut for a really prominent chest, and you mm -hmm. can see that, the shape in, in that chest. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You can see it even laying flat. Okay. That third dimension that the coat maker's created. Yeah, I mean, just look at that pucker right here. Yeah, I mean, it's crisp. My hands flat, and mm -hmm. and this is the first stage. And this is the first stage. And even around to the collar, I mean, again, this is far from completion. We're starting to see the layers built up. You know, I just love all this taping on the inside. I mean, again, uh, all of this is about durability. Yeah. And shape, right? And it doesn't look like much now, but. This is beautiful. I mean, I love seeing jackets at this stage because it looks like a jacket, but it's still so far away from the final product. Yeah, he's not going to be walking out with this And you can see the guts, yet. I mean, the handwork <coughs> that goes into this. And all those basting cottons that we use, those stitches, the basting stitches, I can take these apart and rip these apart without damaging the cloth in any way. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, the provenance of a bespoke huntsman suit is, is British. It's Savile Row. It's being done in London at your premises. Uh, and that's still as true for this garment that you're cutting as it is for one that would be cutting, uh, that one would cut on Savile Row. Well, for 
it to be called a bespoke Savile Row suit, it needs to be made in Savile Row, like a champagne, or it has to come from the source. Do you have a jacket at, a, at the next stage that you can show us? Yeah, so after I fitted this garment and ripped and smoothed it down, uh, it will be rebundled, sent back to London, and uh, it will be assembled to the next stage, which will be finished, but it's called Finish Bar Hole, which will look something like this. So in a coat maker's eyes, this is finished garment. Okay. He's finished his work with this. Um, and when you say the coat maker has finished his, his work, what is that? What, what has he done between this and this? Uh, he has done pretty much everything. He's put the lining in, the pockets in, the facings on, the top collars on. All the main body work has been completed at this point. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, if you were to turn this over, you know, you see, you know, from this stage, you know, that canvas, the yeah. floating canvas, yeah. has then been pad stitched, yeah. you know, to the back of the lapel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what creates kind of the roll that natural, lovely roll. Mm -hmm. Totally individual, you know, made for the client. Yeah. You know, to fit and drape perfectly, yeah. not have any collar gap, you know, to really come together. And again, the handwork and what you get with the proper, you know, British bespoke suit, again, uh, is the durability of the product. And really being able to trust that it's not going to fail, it's not going to look like rubbish, you know, that, you know, it, it can live with you and still retain in the memory of the garment, its shape. Yeah, and you can see it here, laying flat on the table, all that lovely shape. So, actually, here's a baste. Um, it's obviously not for you, but it will give you be a good representation. Uh, not yourself, Kirby. It's not going to fit exactly. Um, but it's just a good representation of what the first fitting would look like. Um, obviously, this client is bigger in the waist. Yes, there's a much larger um, chest. So, you know, what, as a cutter, what are you looking for and what are you changing at this stage? Well, this fitting, this first fitting, I call it my fitting. Okay. So, I'm trying to understand, uh, on a construction point of view, if the coat is balanced, if the shoulder seam is in the correct position, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that the uh, length is established as well and that you're in an agreement with me pretty much um, but at this stage I've got all the inlays at the end of the shoulder here I can let it out take it in um, and I can actually rip down the garment in front of you pretty much I mm -hmm. can take the sleeve out which I probably need to do on this one because it's pitched to the wrong point you've got drags at the back here that's not because it's too big it's actually because the sleeve is rotated to the wrong position mm -hmm. so I'll take those off and give myself a mark where I want those sleeves to be rotated to. Let me undo the sleeve here and okay. show you all the alterations I can do. <clears throat> and actually at the same time, at the back of the sleeve here, it looks like it's big, but it's actually confusing, it's not at all. It's this, the way the sleeve has been pitched and rotate, it needs to be rotated to a different mark. Um, so I'll take that off and make a mark and a note of where the sleeve wants to lay and your arm wants to lay naturally. And so this is where the baste comes in because it allows you to you know, really easily deconstruct the garment without ruining yeah. any of the fabric. Oh, exactly. And I can mark more accurately and I can see it better when this is off. Just leave the move drum slightly, thank you. And there you go. Right. So now we can see clearly where we want that seam to finish. The armhole is too high up. It's catching and breaking there. If you lift your arm ever so slightly, I can mark where it wants to be. And that's going to clear all of that. And it's a bit loose on the end. So I'd pick that up a quarter of an inch at the front. And that'll clean that up. And I'll just let it out, and I've left all this inlay here. I'll just let it out that eighth of an inch, and that's where I want it to be on you. Mm -hmm. um, but there you go. It does look a bit of an odd fitting stage now. Yeah. Um, 
with the sleeve off, but it really does help me. For, mm -hmm. That's why I say it's really for me, this fitting. Um, it's not going to be anything you can walk out the store with. Of course. Um, but that's the beauty of this, the, all the alterations, I can actually perform any alteration at this mm -hmm. stage. And even the same pattern with different fabric, I mean, it's allowing you to see how that specific pattern, or that specific fabric, is kind of interacting with the pattern in the body. Yeah, of course. Because even, I mean, you know, something a little bit lighter weight like this versus, you know, a Tweed or a Super 150 are all going to drape differently, right? Very differently. So what's after this? So you take this, you know, you go and, a, and, and basically memorialize this into the pattern. Yeah. Uh, but this isn't the last fitting, right? No, definitely not. And in most cases, um, I take the first fitting straight to a finished butt hole. Okay. Um, so ideally, it should take three fittings. Okay, the three fittings be this, the finish bar hold, and then the and then final one where you do the buttonholes. Finish, yes. Yeah. Okay, let me take that off. Thank you. This is the next stage. As I mentioned, this is finish bar hole. Again, unfortunately not for you, Kirby. <laughs> um, but let's just give you a feel for it. And so this has the lining put in. Um, and I, I, you know, I can feel the structure, right? So it's fully yes. canvassed at this point, fully, too. Yeah, and it's been pad stitched, um, and the linings are in, more mm -hmm. importantly, so it's much easier to get on compared to the last one. Um, uh, so the back here is much better than the base we saw. It's got a lot more shape in the hollow of your back. It's a lot cleaner through the back drapes. One thing I would do, it's got quite a short collar for you. Um, okay. I'd need to raise that and give you a bigger collar stand. And where would you take the collar up to? Because I've got a rather prominent neck. Uh, generally, the collar stand is an inch and a quarter. I'd give you something closer to an inch and a half. And I think that should make the difference. Um, but not too far off, Kirby. I mean, this gentleman clearly has a much more prominent chest. Hmm. And this, I feel like it does a great job of really illustrating the amount of uh, shape that is built into the canvas. I mean, yes. look at, you know, this isn't my jacket, mm -hmm. and look at how shaped this is. Yes, it gives it a real athletic form to it. Even on a, a, on a hanger or laying flat, you'll still have all that shape that you can really see. And that's one of the big differences I find between a, a true bespoke garment versus something that is, you know, made to measure off the rack, is that you know, the amount of handwork and shaping that goes into the canvas. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a pre-made canvas that just is basted in or, you know, pad stitched in. Right. I mean, this is darted and, you know. That form is created specifically for your shape and your body type. And it really is something that's going to last. That, that shape is never going to leave it. Um, and that's one of the purposes, you know, bespoke. I mean, again, it's not handwork for the sake of handwork. You know, it's really creating durability and longevity to the garment. Yeah, and these, these should last you a lifetime. The point of this bespoke, no stitch in this, in this jacket um, isn't with purpose. Uh, it's not for embellishment, these extra stitches in the chest. It is for a purpose, to create that shape and to withstand time. Um, mm. It's a beautiful jacket. Um, it's a window model, um, so you're pretty close to our window model. <laughs> um, so after the alterations I do to this, at this stage, I will memorialize those into my paper pattern once again. Um, I'll mark these up for alteration. Uh, I'll send it back to London and then it goes to the finisher who does all the felling work and buttonholes. And after that, it goes to the presser. And that's actually a very, very important part of the process. Mm. It memorializes all that shape in the garment. And it's in an hour, it's an hour and a half process. Wow. Um, but that's that, Kirby. Mm. Uh, let me crack on. And so in most cases, it's, what, two or three fittings. I mean, we've got the basted, we've got the bar tack bar, and yes. then I guess, you know, the final would be kind of delivering the final suit. The final, just one last look. Um, and you're not mailing it to the client, I mean. Ideally, I would like to meet them, but we do ship. And from then on, <clears throat> any subsequent orders would go straight to that finish bar hole stage. Okay. Uh, just for one last look. You know, to have you here, to be able to just pop up, say hello, grab a pint, uh, is, uh, you know, is great. So, thank Ralph, you. thank you so much. Let me crack on. I'll yeah, yep. see you in about five weeks. Okay, Thank cheers. you, Kirby. Thank you. Take care. Ed, thank you so much for having me. 
for I me. mean, this really is amazing. I mean, well, you thank know. you for for visiting and thank you for your positive comments. Uh, we welcome you officially as a huntsman yeah, and look forward to seeing you with Ralph yeah, on September 30th. Can't wait happy. to be back for the first fitting. That'll be your base fitting, so yeah. we welcome you back at that time. Yeah, cheers. We'll have a whiskey to celebrate as yeah, well. Yeah, indeed. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks, Ed. Okay, see you soon. Gosh, I love New York so much, and this is such a seamless extension to the experience in London. I hate to go, but I know I'll be back soon. Thank you.